and welcome to today's lecture on Rome and Egypt. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to look at what happens when Egypt stops being its own kingdom and starts being an imperial possession of one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. And I'll give you a hint here. Egypt has just as much of an impact on Rome as Rome does on Egypt. Now, things change to be sure, but much of the iconography, religion, and culture that existed throughout Egypt's history, it remains, albeit with slight alterations, during the Roman Empire. Moving the other direction, Egypt's production of grain, granite, and gold is a huge part of what makes the Roman Empire able to flourish. So whether you're feeling down because the Republic has fallen, or you're excited about the advent of empire, journey with me as we investigate Roman Egypt, emperors and pharaohs. We saw last time that internal problems within Ptolemaic Egypt were just as much of a factor leading to the end of Greek rule in Egypt as the external conflicts with Rome. Dating all the way back to the 200s BCE, Egyptians revolted in large numbers against Ptolemy IV, leading to a 20-year-long civil war. Turns out that portraying yourself like an Egyptian pharaoh just isn't enough sometimes. And it wasn't just problems between Greeks and Egyptians. The Ptolemaic royal family had enough problems of their own. So for example, when Ptolemy VIII died, he left his kingdom to his wife and their son. Seems reasonable enough. But the wife, Cleopatra III, not THE Cleopatra, chased her own son, Ptolemy IX, away so that her younger son, Ptolemy X, could rule with her instead. They exiled Ptolemy IX to Cyprus, and they ruled together until Ptolemy X got sick of sharing power and murdered his co-regent and mother, Cleopatra III, the person who got him on the throne in the first place. Then an angry Egyptian mob called for the return of his older brother, Ptolemy IX, and despite amassing an army to prevent this, Ptolemy X was killed in the ensuing battle. Crazy times indeed. And it just gets worse for the Ptolemies from there. Ptolemy XI only becomes king because the Roman general, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, sets him up on the throne. As king, he marries his stepmother, ugh, his aunt, and his cousin, who all turn out to be the same person. Oh man, you really need a chart to figure out how that actually works. And then, of course, he kills her. Nineteen days later, an Egyptian mob kills him in return. Ptolemy XII spent most of his time emptying the Egyptian treasury to pay off Rome to allow them to remain independent, which works for a while, but is, of course, not a long-term solution. Cleopatra VII comes to the throne only to be embroiled in a civil war with her brother, Ptolemy XIII, and both of them reach out to Rome for help. Ptolemy XIII has Caesar's enemy, Pompey the Great, executed while Cleopatra ends up hooking up with Caesar himself. Cleopatra wins that battle, and a decade later, she's in a new relationship with Caesar's former general and member of the Second Triumvirate, Mark Antony. But after losing to Octavian at the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE, Ptolemaic Egypt's last ruler had fallen, and Egypt became a Roman province. Bye. 
We saw that one of the strategies that Ptolemaic rulers used to establish their authority was to portray themselves as traditional Egyptian pharaohs. Now you might think that as an incredibly strong imperial authority with an incredibly strong imperial army, Rome wouldn't have to employ such strategies to maintain rule and peace in Egypt. But you'd be wrong. Just like the Ptolemies before them, Augustus and later Roman emperors often portrayed themselves as Egyptian pharaohs. In this diorite statue, now housed in the State Museum of, the Egyptian, of Egyptian Art in Munich, Germany, we can see Augustus portraying himself with the physical features and iconographic trappings of the pharaohs of yore. And just to remind you, it's been nearly half a millennium at this point since there was an Egyptian pharaoh in Egypt. It isn't just portraiture that exhibits the hallmarks of pharaonic Egypt. Numerous temples built and restored during the Greco-Roman period would look at home in any New Kingdom context. So this temple here, right, uh, at the site of Kamambo near Aswan, was dedicated to the crocodile god Sobek and the fertility god and goddess Kansu and Hathor. The architectural form is a little bit unusual, but the style of the columns and the capitals and the lintels are, are all clearly Egyptian. The carvings also show Greco-Roman rulers in traditional Egyptian form. And recently, archaeologists have unearthed the stone head of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius in excavations next to the temple. Similar examples of these Greco-Roman temples in the Egyptian style and dedicated to Egyptian gods include those at Dendera, at Philae, at Edfu, and at Esna. The temple at Dendera was completed by the Roman Emperor Tiberius, but the foundations date all the way back to Khufu, builder of the Great Pyramid of the Old Kingdom, 2,500 years earlier. Philae is famous because of its contributions by Nectanebo I, the last great Egyptian ruler of Egypt. But it was also built up by the Ptolemaic and Roman rulers in later periods, with additions and renovations by several of the Julio-Claudian emperors. With their depictions as pharaohs and their contributions to traditional Egyptian-style temples, the Roman emperors are following a millennium-long tradition of acting like a traditional Egyptian pharaoh while ruling Egypt as an outsider. So keep that in mind as outside rulers certainly change things, but for centuries they also make a concerted effort to portray themselves as traditional Egyptian rulers. For the entirety of the empire, Egypt was one of Rome's most important provinces, and not just for the symbolic reasons of its illustrious history. The fertility of the land brought about by the annual inundation make the Nile River Valley, along with the Delta and the Fayum region, incredibly productive regions for growing grain for export. This becomes more and more important as the population of the Roman Empire grew over the first two centuries CE. And this was particularly important for the emperors themselves. One of the ways that people like Julius Caesar and Augustus gained favor with the people was by promising them imperial subsidies, either free or reduced cost grain and olive oil. And this was both an attempt to help out the poor in a massive capital city like Rome, which reached about 1 million people at its peak, but it was also a political savvy way to keep people happy. As the poet Juvenal, the Roman poet Juvenal mentions, right? Give them bread and circuses, panem et circenses, and you won't have to worry about revolts and uprisings. Egypt contributed more than just grain. Some of the most famous monuments in all of Rome are decked out in Egyptian and stone minerals. The eastern desert of Egypt was particularly rich in these products, with places like the Wadi Hammamat, which ran eastward to the Red Sea from Thebes, producing gold mines that were exploited in the Roman era. At the nearby site of Mons Claudianus, Roman soldiers quarried granodiorite, 
that they shipped back to Italy for use in monuments like Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli and across the Adriatic in Diocletian's palace at Split. About 50 kilometers away, we get the Roman settlement at Mons Porphyrites, whose name literally translates as the Porphyry Mountain. Now, Porphyry was a hard, purple, igneous stone, similar to granite. You can see it behind me here. You can still see it used in the columns in front of the Pantheon on Rome. And on this statue of the four tetrarchs that is now built into the side of San Marco Cathedral in Venice. It became particularly prevalent in late antiquity, where it was used in the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and for the slab on which Charlemagne was crowned emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, in 800 CE. One of the major takeaways from studying Egypt during the Ptolemaic and Roman periods is that Egypt, and indeed the entirety of the Mediterranean, was an incredibly diverse and integrated and cosmopolitan place. It's easy for us in our modern context to directly attribute things like race and nationality to certain locations, saying generalizations like white people live in Western Europe or Arab populations live in Egypt and North Africa or black people live in Sub-Saharan Africa, that sort of thing. Now, these sorts of generalizations are not usually a very good idea, but they happen frequently. In Greco-Roman antiquity, however, we get all sorts of mixing of ethnicities and races and cultures. There is no better example of this than the mummy portraits from Roman Egypt. The ancient Egyptian practice of mummification lasted well into the Greco-Roman period. But not all people had the wealth and resources necessary to commission golden burial masks like King Tut. Instead, the practice of painting wooden boards to serve as the burial mask for the deceased became popular during the Roman period in Egypt. These are especially well preserved in the Fayum region of Egypt, an oasis a little more than 100 kilometers southwest of modern-day Cairo. There were two methods of constructing these masks. The encaustic method, or the hot wax method, integrated pigments into hot beeswax. And the encaustic masks provide amazingly bright colors and an almost impressionistic feel. Alternatively, the tempera method combined pigments with some sort of water-soluble binder, like egg yolk. And these usually were a bit more subdued. Comparisons of the masks to the mummies that they cover show that most people were represented at the age of their death, usually pretty young in the Roman world. And while these aren't as resource intensive as the coffins and burial masks of previous periods, they still would have been limited to the upper class, the military, the priests, the scribes, the artisans of ancient Roman Egyptian society. The mummy portraits show an incredible level of cultural mixing and diversity. Skin tones vary widely. There's a huge spectrum in terms of hairstyles. In clothing and jewelry, they differ from one portrait to the next. Some scholars argue that these portraits are a cultural fusion between the Roman imagines, which are images of familial, familial ancestors, and the ancient Egyptian mummification practices. But regardless of whether that link is indeed accurate, these mummy portraits, in fact, serve as some of our most detailed images of regular people from the ancient world. And the cultural diversity exemplified in these portraits is a refreshing reminder that people from all shades of life can get along and live together. The Egyptianizing features of Roman rule in Egypt didn't just stay within Egyptian borders. In Rome, a wave of Egyptomania took over, and Roman emperors brought obelisks from Egypt into the imperial capital. A total of eight obelisks were brought over by Roman emperors, and today they stand in front of some of Rome's most famous monuments. The Pantheon, the Church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, St. Peter's Square, St. John of the Lateran, and a handful of other prominent locations. 
The Romans liked these so much that they started building their own obelisks and putting hieroglyphics on them. But they didn't understand the language, so the text on Roman obelisks are just hieroglyphic gibberish. Everyday people in the Roman world started constructing their own tombs in the tradition of the pharaohs. The monumental pyramid of Cestius was built outside the walls of Rome as a tomb for one of its aristocratic citizens. It was built in the last years of the first century CE, and it stands more than 100 feet tall. And it resembles the steep Nubian pyramids of Meroe, which Rome conquered the decade before Cestius' death. Today, it still stands, part of the later imperial Roman defenses, as one of the best preserved, preserved pyramids from the ancient world, in Egypt, in Rome, or anywhere. This is by far the best preserved pyramid, but others existed near the Vatican and on the Via Appia on the way out from Rome. The Romans also adopted aspects of Egyptian religion. In particular, they took a shine to the goddess Isis, and temples to Isis sprouted up around the Roman Empire, including this one at the site of Pompeii. The worship of Isis was part of what's known as a mystery cult, where worshippers go through a secret initiation process to gain access to secret knowledge. For us, the cult of Isis is best described in the Roman author Apuleius's comedy called The Golden Ass, which describes initiates descending into death and darkness, confronting the gods and emerging into the light. Scholars have often compared these obscure rituals and allusions to rebirth with similar practices within early Christianity. So when you take into account all the different things Rome took from Egypt, grain and stone and obelisks and religion and burial practices, it's clear that this wasn't just one a one-way street, right? With Rome imposing their will on Egypt. As with the Ptolemies before them, the Romans changed Egypt, but Egypt also changed Rome. In the latter days of the Roman Empire, Egypt also became one of the hotbeds of early Christianity. Alexandria continued booming as one of the major cosmopolitan cities of the Mediterranean, and became the seat of one of the most important bishops in late antiquity. Christianity and later Islam ultimately put an end to the culture of ancient Egypt, however whereas the Ptolemies and Roman emperors willingly portrayed themselves like Egyptian pharaohs, and they were happy to accept and sometimes adopt Egyptian religious gods and customs, Christianity and Islam had no place for the pagan polytheism of ancient Egyptian pharaohs and the, the ancient Egyptian past more generally. And, and so the monuments of Egyptian antiquity began to be reburied by the sands of time, awaiting their discovery by archaeologists centuries later. Just a few lessons you can learn from Roman Egypt, Emperors and Pharaohs.